Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this next head talk. So I, I realized the theme. I didn't realize my eye talk was called power, uh, Death by PowerPoint, and this talk is called Neuroanatomy is Dead. I am actually not a morbid person, but it seems like uh, all of my talks have the word death in them. At least this one has the word live in it as well. Um, so people were asking me already, wh what did I mean by neuroanatomy is dead, long live neuroanatomy, right? So you know, the, 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 the queen is dead, long live the queen, or the king is dead, long live the king. It's not that neuroanatomy is dead and we're not gonna have any more neuroanatomy. It's that I really think that it's time to radically reconsider how we use neuroanatomy when we discuss neurology. And we really need to remarket and rebrand what we're doing. You need me to move over? Okay. I'm actually uh, uh, very surprised by these three numbers, okay? 30%, 2%, and 98%. So let's go over what I mean by those numbers. 30% is actually conservative. Approximately 30% of medical students entering medical school, matriculating, are considering a career in neuroscience-related field. They have psychi psychology, biopsychology, neuroscience majors. They come in gung-ho, and when we speak to them in the beginning, they're interested, and there's actually some survey data on this as well. It's approximately 30%. Yet, the next number is 2%. You probably know what that number is, right? Only 2% of US medical school graduates actually enter neurology as a career. And to me, that is a huge problem. What is happening to the other 28%, or obviously, if you do the math, uh, even more than that, right? What is happening to those students along the way? And where are we losing them? And I'm, I'm not gonna propose that I know the answer, but I'm gonna give you what I think might be a little bit of a controversial hypothesis but I think it's, it's something that we need to think about. The other issue, of course, is the 98%. And that number is also important. The 98% are the students that don't go into neurology. And so we really have a number of missions. One mission, of course, is to figure out where we're losing those students so we can inspire students to go into neurology. But of course, at the same time, we cannot lose focus on the 98% because by God, if we decide that we're not gonna focus on the students who are not going into neurology, our patients will seriously suffer because as you can imagine, there's a lot more non-neurologists in the United States than neurologists. There's a massive burden of neurologic disease on the population. Three of the 10 most common chief complaints that present to a primary care office are neurologically based, and that's also a conservative estimate. So we know that most of the neurologic, neurologic care in the United States that's provided to patients is probably not provided by neurologists, okay? So the 30% is an issue because we're losing a lot of those and only 2% are actually doing the field. But we also can't lose focus on the 98% because we need to make sure that everybody graduating medical school has a core understanding of how to approach a patient with a neurologic symptom. And so where are we losing them and what's really going on? Okay, what I think is going on is that we have a significant marketing failure. We have created ourselves into something that seems so lofty that students are actually afraid to do what we do. How many times have you heard somebody say, well, neurology is complicated, it's really hard, it's so difficult, and I'm not talking about students. At this meeting, I could give you two examples I won't not to call anybody out, where I actually heard somebody say that when they put up a slide or a case, and they said, well, neurology is really complicated. If you're a medical student, and you're burdened, and your professor says, this is a really hard concept, you're probably gonna start turning off and turning away. What are we doing wrong? What I think we're doing wrong is relatively straightforward. What I think we're doing wrong is we are teaching the neuroanatomy in a dry way. We are teaching it in a dead way, and probably we are not the ones teaching it, which is a big part of the problem, okay? So when students enter medical school, very often their first, first exposure to, neuro to neurology or neuroscience in a clinical setting is when they learn neuroanatomy, neuropharmacology, neurophysiology, neurochemistry, et cetera, and they're often learning that from basic science faculty members who have never obtained a medical degree and do not see patients and the material seems pretty dead. Now yes, we all say, well we do provide them clinical experiences and we bring in neurologists to try to bring the material to life, but it often seems like an afterthought, okay? 
And maybe some medical schools certainly do this better, but unfortunately, the vast majority do not. And I think we're losing the students when we're trying to teach them the anatomy and then going back and trying to teach them how to take care of patients. The reality is that when you look at fields that are very successful, and I'm not talking about fields where students make a lot of money, because there's a lot of fields that students go into where that's not necessarily a big part of it. Okay? What students are interested, in my opinion, is they're interested in learning how to diagnose and treat disease. They go into medical school because they want to help patients do better and treat disease, not because they want to know how to localize. And I think when we get so excited about localization, and that's what we spend 90% of the patient discussion on, and then at the end we mention the treatment of the disease, it only further elaborates or, 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 or perpetuates the myth that neurologists diagnose and don't do anything. And this is 2016, and I met with a medical student two weeks ago who was a second year entering the third who was interested in neurology, and when I was speaking to her, she was waffling. And so I said, oh, well, it sounds like you're waffling. Are, are other things interesting you? She goes, no, I was speaking to a cardiologist, and he told me, why would I want to go into neurology? You can't do anything. And this was a cardiologist who was relatively young, on the faculty, at an Ivy League medical school, where there's a very strong neurology department, right? So what is going on? This is, to me, the neuromythology which we are actually creating and perpetuating without realizing that we are creating and perpetuating it. By trying to make neurology seem so complicated, and by trying to make everybody understand the anatomy as well as we do, I think we are pushing them away, and I think that's a big part of it. So what I'm not saying is that neuroanatomy is not important. Neuroanatomy is critically important, of course. You can't recognize a stroke syndrome if you don't know your anatomy and somebody comes in when they're dizzy, of course. Okay, I'm not saying that neuroanatomy is not important. I don't want anybody throwing tomatoes at me, okay, or eggs or potatoes or whatever else, okay. Um, I'm a New Yorker, I can handle it, but, but, but please don't. But what I am saying is the following. We need to teach symptoms, diagnosis, and management of disease like every other physician. We have to normalize ourselves. We have to bring ourselves down to the level of every other specialty and that we focus on the workup of disease, the treatment of disease, the mechanism of disease, and bring the anatomy in as part of that, but not make our field based on the anatomy. Not tell people, well, you should go into neurology because you can solve puzzles and localize, and that's so fascinating and so interesting and so complicated, but when you get it, it's an amazing feeling. It is, I know the feeling. Okay, but as a medical student, when they hear us going over localization for four hours and then talking about the last second, we can give TPA to this, and then they go into their other clerkships and their other specialties, and all they're learning about is how to treat disease, I think there's a big disconnect. And maybe it was okay 20 or 30 years ago to only talk about the anatomy and to briefly mention some of the differential diagnosis and then some of the treatment, but we now have such major advances in neurology, students go through the first two years of medical school, and this happens at our medical school, and we have, a, I think, a pretty good program, and they don't really hear much about the treatments for MS, the treatments for epilepsy, the treatments for migraine, the treatments for myasthenia. They learn a lot about how to recognize the disease, and they learn a heck of a lot about how to localize, okay? So perhaps there's a middle ground, and I think there is. I think that we have to consider Whenever we're teaching about a patient and we're bringing in the anatomy, that's okay. But we have to then focus on the disease state, the differential diagnosis, and the treatment of that disease state, okay? I'm, I'm telling you, I think it's a major issue, and I think that our medical students are really suffering, and our specialty is suffering, because we're losing them along the way. I show this slide sometimes, and I showed it this morning at my talk uh, for career development for educators. This was, there was a study done in 2000 and published in 2002 by Sean et al. Actually looking, asking, it's a survey-based study, asking about 1,000 or so general physicians in the United Kingdom. And in the United Kingdom, neurology is a specialty of internal medicine. Some of you have seen this slide. Okay, so neurology is a specialty of medicine. It's not that neurology is separate, okay? And what they did in this study was they asked these physicians to rate in the order of difficulty, knowledge, interest, and 
confidence, various specialties of medicine, including rheumatology, gastroenterology, cardiology, etc. And what you'll see on this, if you look at the paper, is neurology was clearly self-perceived as the most difficult, by far statistically significant. It was self-perceived as, as the physician having the lowest knowledge. Again, this is self-perception, statistically significant. It was self-perceived as being, of the patients having, I'm sorry, of, the, of them having the lowest clinical confidence. So highest difficulty, lowest clinical confidence, okay, least knowledge. Yet for interest, it was rated as the third highest. I think cardiology and pulmonary beat neurology somehow. But it was rated as being the third most interesting. To me, that is what creates neurophobia, right? Neurophobia comes out of a situation where you know something is important and you're interested in it, but you think it's hard and you don't know it and you don't feel confident, right? So I don't really care that I don't know much about string theory because it's not really interesting to me and it's not relevant to my day-to-day -day life, okay? But if I thought driving a car was really complicated and I was really not confident in it and it was too difficult, but I knew it was important, every time I got behind the wheel, I would have a panic attack. And I think that's partly what leads to neurophobia. And what's really interesting in this study is they went back and they asked, why is neurology difficult? And it's really interesting, because what, uh, what I think, what I would have thought was too many diseases, no treatments, too complicated, right? Anatomy is too hard. What was the answer, number one? The teaching was bad. I was taught it poorly. And so they turned it around right on us. Because we keep saying, you know, the cardiologists tell the students, oh, neurology is not interesting, don't do it, why would you want to do it? You know, the, the, uh, uh, the OBs tell the students, why would you want to do neurology? And so we blame it, we externalize the blame. We say, oh, the other specialties are telling our students our field is bad, but it's really great. But I think we are subconsciously telling our students that our field is bad, and we're not even realizing it. And that's where we're losing a lot of the students who probably would have translated that interest in neuroscience into a, clear, a career in clinical neurology. Now, purists might say, would they really make good neurologists if they're not interested in localization? I don't think they're not interested in localization. I think they're very interested in localization, but I think they're more interested in treating disease states and treating their patients. And so that's really why I think neuroanatomy is dead, but I also think that it's going to live on. Thank you.